monsters. <laughs> I used to have a diary. It was made out of some kind of red faux leather material. It came with a little key, so it could be clasped shut and locked. This meant that whatever I wrote down couldn't be read by my brother and sisters or my parents. And there wasn't really that much to hide, but I think what I was afraid of was that what I was thinking and feeling was not only stupid, but probably wrong. By the time you're 10, you've, you've been taught to protect your shameful secrets, covering up a past that's hardly even begun. In my diary, I wrote a lot about monster movies. And this makes sense because boys often feel like monsters, ugly, out of place, and at times reviled. On late night television in those days, I, I stayed up and watched the classic black and white horror films made in the 1930s. Frankenstein, Dracula, The Bride of Frankenstein, Werewolf of London, and The Mummy. These movies starred Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi and uh, the lesser known Henry Ho, who was the werewolf. Identifying with these monsters, as well as their victims and pursuers, was a relatively safe way of grappling with my prepubescent psychosexual fixations. My diary entries were agitated and exclamatory. Tonight, I'm going to stay up until 11 o'clock and watch The Mummy. I can hardly wait. The armadillos in Dracula are really weird. Inevitably, I, uh, I compared and rated the movies, uh, but I think uh, The Bride of Frankenstein had the most impact on me, probably because Elsa Lanchester's performance as the jerky, hissing bride was a turn-on that simultaneously scared the shit out of me. <laughs> uh, check out that hair, huh? <laughs> the most relatable character of all, though, in that movie was Carl, Dr. Pretorius's demented, hunchbacked henchman played by the actor Dwight Fry. Four years earlier, Fry had appeared in Dracula as Renfield, the nice young man who, once bitten by Bela Lugosi, turns into a pathetic, gibbering fly and spider eater. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that could be me, I'll tell you. A few years later, now completely in the grip of puberty, I ogled the Hammer horror films made in England in the late 1950s and early 60s and shot in uh, lascivious, glorious, very gory color. Sitting in the loge section of the Bedford Village Playhouse, I was enthralled by the performances of Christopher Lee as both the Frankenstein monster and Count Dracula. Though he sported a sort of beetle haircut, Lee's monster was more stitched together and less human than Karloff's. And as the deep-voiced, handsome Count Lee, with his red piercing eyes and blood dripping oversized incisors, out Dracula the ghost. <laughs> Importantly, the Hammer vampire films were well stocked with beautiful, busty, negligee clad women whose lovely exposed necks were constantly being bitten and sucked and who then in turn lustily bit and sucked back with their own newly sprouted fangs. Oh, this was as sexy as it got for a 12 year old in 1958. In the universal black and white movies, uh, there wasn't that much that was particularly exciting about the screaming carried off women and uh, Lugosi's uh, sad, thin, sexless, vampire female companions moped around the Transylvania castle like they were in Ingmar Bergman's Cries and Whispers. They were interesting to observe, but not really a turn on. A lot of these movies uh, turn up now on, on, on 
Turner Classic Movies. Occasionally, I'll take a, uh, a look. The, uh, the Hammer Horror Babes seem more silly than sexy, but the scantily clad Fay Ray in King Kong still retains her erotic power, and when the leering, ridiculously cartoonish, black-faced Kong holds Ray in one hand and slowly picks off what's left of her dress with the other, pausing to take a whiff of his gigantic, stubby fingers. It's about as pre-code as it can get. I think for adolescent boys, horror films and magazines, like video gaming to come, offered a way to fantasize and were what used to be called an outlet. Maybe for earlier generations, it was the, uh, uh, the stories of Edgar Allan Poe or Dickensian grotesques that provided this kind of psychic relief. Monsters are inhuman, completely out of control, unrepressed, and, and, and much more terrifying than your run-of-the-mill bad guys and villains who have simply misplaced their moral compasses. And yet, monsters get our sympathy. When the creature makes friends with the blind hermit violinist in The Bride of Frankenstein, we are moved. And at the end of that movie, we feel Karloff's pain when he is immediately rejected by the repulsed Lanchester. For me, that's one of the most heartbreaking and most pitiable put-downs in all of cinema. Love hurts, especially for monsters. I related to the movie Monsters not only because they are powerful and feared, but also because they are misunderstood and doomed. They may be monstrous, but they're largely blameless. And though we are relieved at the end of the movies when they are dispatched by means of fire, wooden stake, silver bullet, a fall from the world's tallest skyscraper, we are happy when they manage to return, to live again in continuing vehicles like the son of, the curse of, the revenge of, and Abbott and Costello meet. I wish I still had that red childhood diary. But our family home burned down in 1967, and the diary, like all of the house's contents, was incinerated. I can't quite remember what else I wrote about back then, but I imagine it must have been girls. The fear and horror of love, romance, and sex. In this up-and-coming real-life realm, I became all the movie characters. The Frankenstein monster, the vampire, the werewolf, the expressionless mummy, the hunchbacked grave robber, as well as a member of the angry, avenging, bloodthirsty village mob. The electrical storm is captured and channeled in the castle laboratory of Dr. Frankenstein. And we have a divine moment of creation, not unlike Michelangelo's creation of Adam, when the fingers of the assembled creature move for the first time. We rejoice along with his agitated creator. Death has been beaten, albeit temporarily, and we thrill when Colin Clive ecstatically proclaims, It's alive! 